The Indian subcontinent is the South Central Asian Peninsula that stretches from the Himalaya to the Indian Ocean. Contrasting land, frigid mountains, dense jungles, and low-lying tropical waters. 80% of its inhabitants are Indic Hindus. Incurably curious, I jumped at the chance to learn about these people and their cultural communication customs when invited to speak at a conference in New Delhi, India. I learned much on the trip, but what I share now is prompted by my book club's interest in what I learned about women in India as what I discovered aligned with discussion of the storyteller's secret, a story about the daughter of Indian parents who immigrated to America. Tourists on buses look out their windows. Tourists know what guides choose to tell them. Guides tell tourists what they are told to tell them. Tours are easy and informative, but to know a country beyond its surface, you have to leave the bus to meet the people to learn their stories. I stepped off the bus, hopped in rickshaws, on the back of scooters, and camels to bump glide from north to south to learn. I've found that when you share yourself and your stories, other people share theirs. I came to share, hoping that in turn, the Indic people would too. I explored during wedding season, so marriage customs were on my mind. I took calculated risk with no regrets. Once, I was in a rickshaw when I heard in the distance the blaring of music. I had my driver change route to follow the sound, then stop so I could get out among the people to watch and participate. People danced in the middle of the street. I did too as I gyrated in and out of the crowd, admiring rich colored clothing embellished with embroidery, pearls, and stones. Mysterious cultural excitement consumed me. I wanted to understand. At the conference where I was invited to speak, several women explained to me over meals and in between sessions arranged marriages, matchmaking through newspaper classified ads, and horror of horrors, bride burning. The start of marriage is a celebration, but all marriages do not end celebrated. The value of a bride to a groom and his family is twofold, her domestic contributions and as a source of money through an expected dowry. Dowries are outlawed, but dowries are a traditional custom expected by everyone. Traditions die hard. India is a poor country. According to the World Population Review in 2020, the median income is $3,168. Parents do not have the money to pay dowries. When parents don't pay dowries or don't pay enough money, rides are burned. A bride is burned every 90 minutes on the subcontinent. Approximately 8,000 women die each year to dowry deaths, usually from intentional kitchen fires, often hot grease thrown on the bride by the mother-in-law. If the bride lives, she is often permanently disfigured, and because neither her husband nor her family want or can afford her, she becomes a beggar. This is India's dirty little secret. A female baby is bad luck. Not just girls born on nights of a full moon. Girls are a financial burden and liability because they are not strong enough for hard labor. Most have limited education. The groom's family expects a dowry because they will assume financial responsibility for her. Boy babies are the prize. They provide labor and get more education. Historically, couples on the subcontinent have turned to abortion when they learn the sex of a female fetus. To prevent this, the government outlawed abortion, but couples that can afford to travel go to countries where abortions are legal. 
The poor, who cannot afford to travel, turn to female infanticide. India is changing with education and exposure to progressive areas of the world where women are valued. Education is the biggest hope for Indic women, but because many schools lack bathrooms, most girls drop out of school when they begin menstruation. Melinda and Bill Gates are giving money to build bathrooms in hopes that girls will remain longer in school. The government launched the Pink Police to help with the security of women and children because male police officers turn blind eyes to the problems of women. The marquee sign at my hotel read, invites you all. Sounded Southern to me. Not sure they meant it, but when I opened the curtains from my room that overlooked the pool and saw an interesting gathering with music, I decided to accept. The attire was dressing, so I threw on a dress. I walked in under a magical canopy of foliage and lights and struck up a conversation with a man who turned out to be the groom's uncle. He took me under his wing and we sat on the front row as he explained the nuances of this ceremony, exchanging of rings, which occurs before a wedding. 300 guests were invited. 600 will attend the wedding. The couple's parents had met to arrange the wedding, but this was the first time the bride and groom met. The bride is a lawyer, the groom a scientist working in Australia. The ceremony was long. Many gifts were exchanged between families in addition to the couple's rings. After the ceremony, everyone was invited into a hotel ballroom to a traditional Indian dinner. We ate with our hands. I met Suresh at the conference in Delhi. He knew I planned to visit his city, Chennai, in southern India during my travels and invited me while I was at the conference to join him for dinner with his family. Chennai is the birthplace of the civil rights activist and biologist mother of newly elected American Vice President Kamala Harris. Suresh, a German teacher full of positive energy, is devoted to his only child, a daughter. His home included a typical Hindu home shrine with images that help Hindus focus on different aspects of Hindu gods. Only one book was in sight, Mein Kampf, which was positioned on top of the shrine. I asked Suresh if he liked Adolf Hitler, and he said yes. I asked why, and he said Hitler was for education for everyone. Suresh did not know about the Holocaust, so I urged him to read about it. In the time since I met Suresh, he has started a lending library in his neighborhood. I appreciated the time and effort of his family to entertain me. I could see into the small kitchen and realize that cooking in India is not as easy as it is back home, where appliances are modern and safe water runs freely. The family stood in a circle around me to watch me eat every bite, periodically asking in Tamil language if I liked their food. Suresh translated as he was the only one who speaks English. His family liked that I wanted to know about them and their customs. The tenor turned out to be a bit of a makeover. His daughter, who I called Sunshine because I had difficulty pronouncing her name, covered my face with pretend makeup and tried to groom my disheveled hair. His mother-in-law draped me in a sari. His wife adorned me with jewelry and gifted me with a tikka tray. They, the transformation pleased them. The family wanted photographs with me. Suresh's father-in-law changed his clothes and asked me to dance. One curious custom that is still a puzzle is that after I changed back into my clothes, 
They draped my shoulders with a towel and insisted I take it home with me. Then they presented me with an official invitation to an upcoming family wedding. Maybe the significance of the towel was actually a nonverbal message that I should clean up before coming to the wedding. I confess, I looked bedraggled when I arrived, having ridden on the back of Suresh's motorbike for over an hour to reach their home. I wish I could have stayed for the wedding. Perhaps one day, I'll return to dance at Sunshine's wedding. Hello, my name is Bharti Naik, and I'm from a small town of India, Vadodara, Gujarat. And uh, why I'm mentioning this is because yesterday I attended Jane's session, and that's where she, when she started her introduction, she talked about that she's from a very small town. And that where it really, really admired that oh, if she can speak at a global level and talking about and she feeling proud of that she's from a small town, I felt and I realized that yes, I can also be proud of my city, my place from where I am and the kind of rich heritage, the rich values that I bring in. And the another thing that I liked about Jane's session was the kind of examples she was giving, which were so practical, and the stories that she was building in the session, that actually helped me to connect with my stories, my life, and bring in a lot of learnings in that. So thank you so much, Jane, for this. I really, really look forward to more of such sessions with you. Thank you. Hello friends, my name is Kumar Achanta. I am from India, Hyderabad. Uh, I have heard Jane Hyde McMurray at New Delhi, India, and she is an amazing speaker. She, 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 she holds the audience on her palms and she can connect with audience so easily. I just loved her presentations. She was phenomenal. I, I somehow I totally connected with her uh, when she was giving the presentations and she, what a beautiful presentation she had. You know, every point was clearly explained and I think she's totally different when it comes to connection with people. You know, there are many speakers out there, probably you, they, they do their work and go, but she connects with the audience, she can have all the audience in your palm. So if you're thinking of your next conference or an event, Jane Height McMurray, is the person that you got to reach out to. Thank you so much, Jane. Thank you so much for coming to India. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.